Welcome to today's lesson on homeostasis. Homeostasis is the ability of an organism to keep a stable internal state or equilibrium. Systems respond to external, so outside of the organism, and internal, so inside of the organism, changes to function within a normal range. We discussed the characteristics of life and we talked about how all living things have to be able to maintain a stable internal environment. That is known as homeostasis. So what are th some things that humans need to keep in a normal range? We discussed temperature. The normal human body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly 37 degrees Celsius. Once we start to climb, our temperature starts to climb, we reach what's known as a fever. And if our body temperature goes too low, we run the risk of hypothermia. Our body systems work best at 37 degrees Celsius. So our body will work hard to try to keep us at that temperature. Our blood pH is 7.4, which if you remember from chemistry is slightly alkaline. Seven is neutral, so blood is pretty close to seven, but it's slightly alkaline at 7.4. The homeostatic level of blood pressure is 100 milligrams of mercury. We try to keep our blood sugar at 0.1%, and the water content in the average human body stays at 40 liters. So how do our bodies do this? How do they keep us at homeostasis? They do this through things known as feedback loops. Feedback loops have three main components. There's a receptor. A receptor is going to receive a stimulus. There's a control center which processes the signal and sends instructions, and there's an effector that carries out those instructions. So let's look at an example. For example, you might be at homeostasis, which is a normal body temperature, and you're super happy you're at 98.6. Now something happens. Let's say it gets really hot outside. The temperature's climbing. It's a summer day. The sun is shining, and your internal body temperature starts to rise. What happens is receptors will detect that. Receptors in your body pick up information, and that information is, it's too hot in here. We're going above the normal body temperature. That's what those receptors do. They're temperature receptors. And the receptors will carry this message all the way to the control center inside of the brain. And the brain will make sense of that information and say, hmm, we need to come up with a response. And the response that your brain will send is going to travel to things known as effectors. In this case, the effectors include your sweat glands. So you're going to start sweating and you're going to, through sweating, bring your body temperature back down to homeostasis, back down to normal. So there's three parts to a feedback loop, a receptor, which picks up the information, a control center, which makes sense of it, an effector, which is going to carry out an instruction. So humans again, like to stay at 98.6. So let's look closer at what happens when the body temperature either drops or rises. So first of all, let's say it's very cold outside and you forgot your coat. Your body temperature starts to drop between 90, be, below 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So your body temperature receptors are going to pick up on that change and they're going to take that information to the thermal regulatory control center inside of the brain. The brain then is going to send a message to the effectors. You begin to shiver. Yeah, muscles are going to contract and begin to shiver. And your blood vessels will actually get smaller. They're going to constrict. They're going to pull together and try to preserve heat. As a result of these actions, your body temperature is going to start to rise. Now, what happens if the opposite is true? What if your body temperature rises above 99 degrees Fahrenheit? Again, your body temperature receptors pick that information up. They take the information to the thermal regulatory control center, and then your brain sends messages to the effectors. You begin to sweat, right? Your sweat glands are effectors, and your blood vessels are going to do the opposite of what they did before. They're going to get bigger. They're going to dilate, and they're going to come close to the surface of your skin, and they're going to let go of their heat. That's why somebody who's hot is going to appear flushed, right? Their skin is going to look red. This is part of the cooling mechanism. As a result of these actions, your body temperature decreases and you get back to homeostasis. So that is temperature control inside of the human body. So how do animals regulate their body temperature? Can you think of some things animals do so that they can maintain homeostasis? 
I'll give you a minute to think about it. So some of the things animals can do is seek out sun or shade if it gets too hot. You can see turtles kind of sunning themselves on top of rocks. When their body temperature gets too hot, they simply jump in the water. Some animals engage in burrowing and shivering behaviors. Dogs cool off by panting. And these emperor penguins are huddling for warmth. So let's take one more look at negative feedback or feedback through thermal regulation, which is what we just discussed before. So once again, body temperature rises. What happens? The receptors in the body pick up that information. They take the information to the control center inside of the brain. The brain sends a signal to the effectors, your blood vessels, and your sweat glands. And what's going to happen? You're going to have your blood vessels dilate. You're going to start to sweat. And as a result, you're going to come back down to homeostasis. All right, let's look at the opposite situation. So let's say your body temperature drops. Body's temperature receptors pick up the information, take the information to the brain. The brain sends signals to the effectors. In this case, your blood vessels are going to constrict. You're going to start shivering. And as a result, your body temperature is going to start to rise and get back to homeostasis. Now, we talked about feedback loops. There's two types of feedback loops, negative feedback loops and positive feedback loops. Everything that we discussed so far was a negative feedback loop. Negative feedback loops oppose variation from normal. So, for example, if you get too hot, your body does something to cool you down. If you get too cool, your body does something to warm you up. In either case, you're going against the variation. You're trying to bring back to normal. You're trying to get back to homeostasis. Positive feedback exaggerates variation. So you're going to do the opposite, right? So let me show you an example. Let's say you get a paper cut. A paper cut causes a break in a blood vessel and you start to bleed. The damaged cells, the ones that you slice through with the paper, they're going to start releasing chemicals. The chemicals will cause blood clotting to begin. Now here we're going to enter a positive feedback loop. Um, what's going to happen is as you're clotting, more chemicals are going to be released and the clotting is going to speed up. The clotting is going to release more chemicals and the chemicals are going to cause more clotting and the more clotting releases more chemicals. And this kind of is a runaway loop that's going to keep happening until that blood clot is going to be plugged and that break in the wet vessel wall is going to be filled and the bleeding is going to stop. So one more time, clotting causes chemicals to be released. The chemicals cause more clotting. The more clotting releases more chemicals. The more chemicals causes more clotting all the way until that vessel wall is plugged. So which do you think is more common, negative feedback or positive feedback? As it turns out, negative feedback is much more common in the body because most of the time you just want to get back to homeostasis and your body's going to only act if you get away from normal. Positive feedback loops happen much more rarely. One example in humans is with uh, bleeding and clotting. That's going to be one example of a positive feedback loop. And the other common example of a positive feedback loop occurs during childbirth. During childbirth, a woman's body is going to release a hormone known as oxytocin. And what oxytocin does is it's going to cause contractions of the uterus. As the uterus contracts, the contractions are going to actually release more oxytocin. The more oxytocin is going to cause more contractions and the contractions release more oxytocin. It becomes a runaway reaction all the way until that baby is born. So these are very special events in a human's life. Day to day, normal times, most loops are going to follow negative feedback. So let's talk about exercise. Homeostasis and exercise. Exercise is actually very challenging on your body. It challenges your body's homeostasis. Why? Well, first of all, your metabolism increases. Everything speeds up in your body. You begin to run out of oxygen and you begin to run out of nutrients. Waste start to build up. So a lot of carbon dioxide builds up in your body. Lactic acid builds up inside of your body and your body heat increases. So this is a huge challenge to your body's internal balance. How do you respond? How can you counteract and get back to homeostasis? Well, some of the things that happen 
in response to exercise to get you back to homeostasis include an increase of heart rate. You can feel that. You run up the stairs, your heart starts beating faster, and your blood starts to flow faster. This way, you can carry more nutrients and more oxygen to your cell. By the way, you start to also breathe more deeply and more quickly. And this combination is going to allow you to get rid of wastes like carbon dioxide more quickly. And you can also deliver blood to your skin, allowing you to cool off. This was homeostasis. Thank you so much for listening.